With that, uh, I would like to introduce Johan Blanken, who is uh, the chair of the board for LEARN. Uh, she comes to us uh, with great experience from the British Columbia Law Library System. Um, and uh, her current position, uh, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, is with uh, UVic as the director of the Access to Justice Center for Excellence. Um, she has been a, a great person to work with and uh, we look forward to meeting with her in the coming months. So, Johan, um, I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I must confess that when I first got this invitation, uh, I accepted with some trepidation knowing how painful the cuts had been and that we were not particularly popular. But I can say that we have had the opportunity now to not only meet with all the shareholders, but to, to have a meeting uh, with Nathan and Bill and Katie um, this earlier this, this week to actually talk about how we can repair that relationship, which, which has been Im impacted by the cuts and how we can work together going, going forward. Yesterday, I gave an interim report to the uh, Law Society Finance and Audit Committee and uh, was grilled uh, by them about uh, costs and, and where the li libraries are, are going. So I did give them a heads up that the cuts, the cuts were deep that uh, the libraries need more funding and that we're gonna be coming back with a, definitely with an ask for more funding. This year, thankfully, we have time. Last year, unfortunately, I think because it was COVID, it was, it was done very quickly. There was no time. And essentially, uh, we were just told what the amount would, would be and that, would, that was that. This year is different. We now have time and we can look at, look at that. So what LEARN has been doing over the last year is that when I spoke to you last May, we didn't even have a managing director. It was just the board getting set up. Teresa Leach started in August and she has now had an opportunity to meet with every librarian and library staff in the province. And she set up regular meetings with them. We've also hired somebody, a former librarian on, on contract to help us collect data because one of the, the big, challenges is that we don't have enough data to make a really strong business case. And so we've now been building up that, that data on, uh, on the library system. There are still gaps. And that's what we want to work with you on the gaps. And one of the glaring gaps is we don't know exactly how much the associations top up their library grants. So we, we all know you do, but we don't know by how much. So we don't know what this, what this network actually costs. We know what the Law Society puts in in terms of the grants, but we don't know the full costs. So that's something that with, as, I, as we work with you, we would like to get a better handle on that because the goal is to have a library system that is properly funded so that association funds can go to uh, practice resources and things that are more directly tied to uh, practice tools to support lawyers in the 21st century. The space, of a library is important and the library staff are important. But libraries now are not as tethered to place as they were historically. Many of the younger lawyers meet virtually rather than at the physical plant. So it's not space or digital or virtual resources, it's and. They are both important. They're both equally important. You don't sacrifice one for the other. So that's something that we have to keep in mind as we're looking at how to resource and how to, how to navigate these. The other aspect is that this is a library network, but it's not really set up to function as effectively as it could as a network. It's set up with each library managing its own setup. But we know from talking to librarians that they do work together. There is uh, in, or there are informal networks and our goal is to support that. So we have a better idea about are resources being allocated effectively? We know with the budget cuts that the way they were allocated had, had some, un, some very unfortunate unintended consequences. We know that. And we don't want to be in a position where that happens again. At the time that we had to make those decisions, we didn't have enough information. We have a much better handle on it now. And now we have time to actually work with you and work with other sta stakeholders as well to make sure that we are setting this up in a, in, a, in a healthy, constructive way. Now, the other aspect here, and the Law Society's raised it as well, 
and our board has looked at it, and that is that the Law Foundation has a statutory mandate to fund law libraries, but stopped doing it back in 2014. So that is on our radar. Uh, and so we, we have to figure out the best strategy for that. But I am going to be reaching out to the, the um, I spoke to the previous uh, executive director and was just told, no, we don't do any operational funding. We've stopped funding libraries. It's not part of our policy, but it, it may not be part of their policy, but it is part of their statutory mandate. So we do need to have those conversations conversations and we do need to work with them. And I think that's one area where the, the Law Society will work with us. But as I explained to the Finance Committee yesterday, it's not a quick fix. That is not going to happen overnight. So that's we need to, to develop a plan of what can we do now? Where do we want to go? What steps do we take now? And how do we get there? So there's, there's a number of things that uh, we need to do and we need to be working on. One of the things that we have noted with the data we've collected that's really quite disturbing is that the um, computers and the hardware that people are, are using in the libraries, most of it dates back to 2014. In today's world, uh, technology isn't the tool, it's the environment we live in. And that's a limiting factor when you've got equipment that's that outdated. So we are gonna be looking for a, a substantial capital refresh for that right off the bat and then to look at how we can improve the digital resources and shift that balance between print and digital, but not in a cookie cutter way, because it's important to understand that each region in each area has different needs. So there may be some things where there's some economies of scale that you can do across the board, but not everything. So it's really important to preserve that local input and responding to local needs, as well as creating some, some I don't like the word standards because that, that has a, a sort of prescriptive tone, but, but some consistency, some sort of basic things that, that, that everybody would reasonably expect they have access to. So this is, this is achievable. And thankfully this year, the, the budget doesn't have to be submitted until September. So we have time to work on it. And Teresa and I are committed to working with whatever working group you uh, set up so that we can start to discuss these, these things and start to move this agenda forward. So what I'd like to do now is actually um, not talk anymore at you and give you the time to ask questions. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions uh, for Johanna or myself, um, please uh, speak up now or use the chat function. We're happy to answer either way. Um, you can, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, my name is Ted Mann. I'm East Region Rep. And Joanne, what concerns me about uh, how you're speaking is that it, it strikes me that you are severing out the bricks and mortar of the building from the association. And so your question is how much of the money that is given to the association goes towards the library? Uh, I come at it, and I think many of us come at it from a different perspective, that the library uh, in, in each county uh, is a community hub. So the, the, the function of that space uh, as uh, bricks and mortar, uh, as uh, a source of whether uh, online or hard copy uh, paper research, the, uh, uh, the existence of the association and the library for CPD events, uh, for uh, support of lawyers' mental health, all of that is, is intertwined. And I, with the greatest of respect, I think it's a mistake to uh, try to isolate out expenses on bricks and mortar without appreciating the, uh, the unique whole uh, or, or togetherness that there is between the association and the bricks and mortar building. Uh, and that in fact, what we're dealing with is, is a community hub rather than, and, and as I understand the progress of libraries generally in communities uh, ac across the province, not law libraries, but uh, libraries generally, they also have become community hubs. Uh, and it seems to me that that is, is, a, is, a, is a, a shifting uh, of the uh, role of libraries in each community in the province. And, 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 I, and I have to say the local aspect of, of county libraries and their associations is extraordinarily important to the health of the legal system in the province. 
So I, I, I just wanted to raise, and I, I love your comments on, on my perspective, and I think that of many of us, to that interrelationship between the association and the library and how together they serve the needs of the legal community in each county in the province. That's a good question. And here's one of the challenges uh, with that approach. And that is that every lawyer, every licensee, every lawyer in the province pays the same library fee. So the concern that is coming from the Law Society is that there needs to be equity of access to library services to everyone, whether they're a member of the association or not. And so we are trying to navigate that so that you preserve the library as a community hub and but that all lawyers do have access and there's some equity of access and then there's the association and how it fits in with the library and what it does for their members it doesn't have to be either or but that's a problem in terms of uh, delivering library services to all the lawyers which is our mandate and so we can't we have to look at the role of the association which is an important role uh, and, and I know what, how important that is in smaller communities, having practiced in a small community in BC. So it is, it is an important role and the library can and should play a part of that. But we have to be able to make sure that lawyers who are not members of the association can go into the libraries and expect a, a certain level of resources. That's that's just a given. So so that's that's the discussion we're going to have as to how we do this to preserve the role of the associations and the important role they play to keep the library as a community hub, but also be in a position where uh, every every lawyer, whether they're a member or not has, has uh, ac access to the library, to the, to the core services. That doesn't mean as associations can't do value add and extra resources. That, of course you can, in fact, should. But it's, but it's really critical that we, we uh, have those discussions around what those sort of basic services are. Johan, uh, there's been a question asked in the chat um, in two different ways, so I'll, I'll put it to you. Um, there are concerns about um, public access to the library um, and whether or not um, this is going to be something that the LEARN board is considering or not? That's a good question. Uh, the law societies raise that as well. Uh, it always comes up in terms of access to justice that the, and especially here, the courthouses are publicly funded buildings. And so uh, should the libraries be open to the public as well? What I've suggested to the um, ventures and what the board has looked out is ideally because they are public buildings they should be open to the public however that requires different skill sets in terms of staff in terms it will have an impact on staffing and other other aspects so that's not something to push right now that's something that we actually need to have a, a lot more conversation around and i say that as somebody who operated a library system that that did serve the public and it and it changes the dynamic and the public's needs are different from lawyers' needs. So it, it's an issue. We need to talk about it. We need to work with it, but I don't think it's our number one priority. I think most of the libraries or many of them are, are already open to the public. So, and some of the smaller ones, it's a physical barrier because you have to go through the barrister's lounge to get to the library. So that's, that would involve some construction. Here's your Achilles heel with that because it's a public building and you get the space provided by the government, by the attorney general. In Quebec, where their library system is funded by lawyers, for lawyers and judges, they pay rent because they're not open to the public. So that hasn't happened here yet, but that's entirely possible that if it's just open to the lawyers and possibly paralegals, you could end up with having to pay rent. So it is something to discuss, but I don't think that it's, there are too many other pressing issues right now and that's not, that's not top of mind. It's important to uh, also recognize that in Ontario, other, unlike other provinces, you've got very robust public legal education uh, so societies who do great work, who make a lot of work uh, and a lot of information available. You've got a good legal aid system 
I know you've had a lot of cuts, but in, in BC, we look at your legal aid system and think, my God, we'd, we'd be in heaven if we had that. Uh, BC got really slammed by uh, cuts. So in order to look at that access to justice issue, you've got to look at it holistically. And that's to look at what services are there for the public. Are there ways that we could work with public libraries who are that are open more hours than courthouse libraries? So there's a number of different options. There's no quick fix with it. Do we have any other questions? Yes, I have a question for Joanne. It's Vanessa from um, P Law Association. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I've been. Uh, very worried about having to ask this question, but um, our association has been very um, significantly in, impacted by the funding cut. And it is a very real possibility that we might have to make the unpleasant decision of laying off staff. How will that affect our funding going forward? I'm, I'm wondering if any of the other associations are having this concern and certainly like for suggestions as to how we could do it. Right, I, do, I, we're not aware of the situation with the other asso associations. Here's one thing we do know, and that is that at the end of December, 2020, there was close to 1.4 million in uh, balances sitting across the library network. Now, some libraries had deficits, some had have, have more. So there were some resources. Now we don't know enough about that. We don't know if those funds have been earmarked for various things, if they've already, if they're already going into uh, other expenses, or if there, if there's a cushion of funding there that could be used throughout the network. The challenge we have with it is that every library has an expectation of confidentiality. So that, so the breakdown of where those funds are is not something we can share without some consent and some input from the library. So this is something that I have raised. Uh, when I met with Bill and Nathan and Katie, and we do need to look at that. And we do need to look at ways that, are there ways that we could reallocate some funds right now to take the pressure off some of the organizations that are in the position that you're in. Uh, so there, so there, are, there, there is room to, a little bit of room to maneuver. However, the other part of this is that with the cuts last year, the LIRN uh, board took half of our reserve funding and used it towards the grants to uh, minimize the cuts. So that instead of a full 10%, we put 5% in so that, uh, so that it would make it a bit, um, it would be less harsh, let's put it that way. So we don't have a lot of reserves ourselves to deal with at the moment. But there are some fund balances there. There are some things we can we can work with. But we need to know if if there are issues with with layoffs, if things are happening imminently, then we we can't help you if we don't know. So this is something that is really important that we have a a um, solid working relationship with you, and we get the information in a timely fashion so that we can actually work with it. And because of COVID. And because LEARN is a, is, a, is a new board setting up a new structure with a new mandate, we've moved as fast as we can, but we didn't even have a managing director until August. So, and then the pandemic hit. So we've been going as quickly as we can. We now have a pretty solid foundation. So it's freed up some time to actually spend on these issues as well. There's a number of issues that are, are urgent and, and need to be addressed. And staffing is certainly top of mind. We have, that's something we have been very worried about. Um, may I ask as a follow-up question? I hope it doesn't take too much time. Can you explain a little bit more about the funding formula? The funding, the we just based the grant formula on what had been done before. We just took what Library Co had already been doing and we worked with that. Part of our strategic planning and part of our strategic plan is to review that whole grant process and come up with better policies. Because it's what became very clear to us is, was that we had to act in, in almost an arbitrary manner. And uh, none of us were happy with that with the cuts, none of us. And so this, this grant system and how it's allocated dates back to Library Co. And we don't even know how long it's been in existence. It needs to be revamped completely and that's definitely on the agenda and the sooner we can we can do that the better mm -hmm. 
One thing I can tell you, though, is having been at the Finance Law Society Finance Committee yesterday, is that, um, as you all know, you have a very polarized group of ventures. And there are still a large portion of them who are still very committed to cuts and more cuts. So it's um, being able to build a business case with as much data as we can get is going to be really critical because it's very divided. I can certainly echo Johan's comments on that. And um, I, you know, I'm already looking ahead uh, that I will be taking over as chair in November, which means I will be in the chair's seat during the uh, election run up from fall of 2022 into the election in 2023. And certainly uh, a focus of my term will be on uh, the venture election and making sure that uh, we advocate for ventures and venture candidates who are willing to support the library system. And I hope that everyone will be ready and able and willing to, um, to use their base of voters. We represent 12,000 lawyers across the province. We represent more lawyers uh, through our associations than any other group in the province. That's a lot of political clout if we can get the vote out. So um, that is something that uh, I will be asking everybody to start looking at uh, in the coming year and a half to two years. Thanks. One of the things that we've discovered, having worked with, um, you know, spoken to a number of different people, a number of different stakeholders, and especially dealing with the uh, law society as well, there's a lot of assumptions and misperceptions out there. So this is why uh, we're we've been a bit of a broken record when it comes to data, because data is your that's going to really make a big difference. It's it's without that data to show. Uh, how the libraries are used and the usage stats are sort of hit and miss across the system. But to be fair, and as I keep reminding the ventures, there was a, a, a rather large gap between Library Co and the Learn Board and the librarians were holding it all together uh, during a fairly lengthy transition. And then we got dumped into a pandemic. So it's the perfect storm and you can't expect to get have everything lined up with all your ducks in a row in a very short time frame, given that background. And so there's, there's a number of things that need to be addressed and we need to do them in a, in a sensible way. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's the other part that I think is, is really critical here, that we, we can't get all the data we like right off the bat. And frankly, we don't need to. I think we have enough now and we can start collecting it that we can act what's, what's missing, that we can make a strong business case. Johan, what do you see the role of the Great Library in the system? That's the other question. And we've, we have raised that, is that uh, with the uh, Law Society, is that we have this library network, but the Great Library is separate from it. Now, there's some historical basis for that. The Great Library also, it's not totally comparable to the libraries in the Learn Network because it does fulfill a sort of corporate library function for the Law Society. It looks after archives, it looks after IT. So that's something where they actually have to do some work to kind of tease out what it does that's pure, that's really tethered to the Law Society's needs and what are general library needs. And we need to have that conversation around how it fits into this network. And we've already raised that. It's on the radar. It is, it, it is something that needs to be addressed. And certainly the provision of legal or of legal research um, to all of the members of the Law Society, yeah. of course, needs to be provided through the Great Library as well uh, as the yeah. local association. So, yeah. so thank you for yeah. that. It does. Uh, one last call for any other questions. Uh, Nathan, it's, it's Alan Weinperl. Uh, uh, Joanne, I'm, I'm the Central South uh, Regional Rep. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, LEARN has had any discussions with the law society about paralegals paying the library levy or a, or maybe even a reduced levy of some sort that came up at the finance committee yesterday because they they asked about paralegals and i said well uh, on one hand you could say they're like members of the public they have access to the libraries but but they're they're licensees and so uh, they should be paying a library fee and that's a live issue so that's can something for that and, and uh, what, 
Can you can you give us any sense of how that was received uh, by uh, the finance committee? Sorry, was it first of all was it them who brought it up in the first place, and and how was how were your comments received? I can't recall who brought it up in the first place, but somebody asked that question, and uh, it's hard to tell when you're looking at a room full of people over a Zoom, and they're all pretty good at. So I I don't know how it was it was received. I'll find out afterwards. I'll do some more digging around, but I think they know that. I think there's pressure of the paralegal association from my understanding doesn't really want to pay any library fees. So it is something that needs to be addressed. Certainly everybody and presidents, I do uh, hearken to this question because if paralegals are paying a library levy, they will be required to have additional access. Uh, and depending on the association that may have no impact or it may have significant impact but it's something that FOLA will definitely be seeking input from the associations on as we continue that conversation with regard to uh, paralegal access or not. And certainly I, my mind has shifted in the 15 years since paralegals have been um, licensed in uh, whether or not they should be members. Uh, and I hope that everyone will come to it with a fresh mind uh, as we discuss that on an ongoing basis. Alan, I see you unmuted again. No, no, it's, uh, well, I was just going to say, I, I, I will just say that that topic was brought up at the uh, Central South uh, President's meeting that we re recently had, our regional meeting, and it seemed uh, unanimous amongst associations that there, there was some willingness to consider the issue of access for paralegals to the library, forgetting about the issue of membership to the associations, but access to the library in exchange for um, library levy um, by all paralegals in Ontario. And I think, uh, I think that that day may be upon us. If I could just say something from Ottawa, we have paralegal members in our association and we allow paralegals access to our library. And if I could speak on behalf of the Waterloo Region Law Association, we have paralegal members as members of our association. They access everything every other member does uh, on the basis essentially that they are licensees of the law society and it's difficult to see a principled basis on which they uh, are more like the public than they are like a lawyer. And um, we actually have a dedicated spot on our um, board of trustees for, um, for a paralegal member. And so they participate in the, essentially in the same way that we do. And as I say, it's hard to see a principled basis to say they're more like the public, at least in my mind, but it's, I guess, something that there'll be lots of discussion about. We've also okay. added a paralegal member to Sorry, we've also added a paralegal member to our board in Ottawa. And they yeah. pay the same fees? So, no, they don't. Well, in our case, they pay the same fees to belong to our association as, as a lawyer does. It's something certainly as well for membership and associations. I'm a member of Northumberland Law Association in addition to a couple of others. They actually charge more for paralegals because they recognize that there isn't a par a library levy so they charge very similar fees to join the association on top of the same as what the library levy would be um, so that's a way that's a way that they are in some way collecting a uh, library levy in an indirect basis um, from paralegal members in that county so there are there are many ways of looking at that although they are a separate class of member and not allowed to vote on uh, on certain issues so it's a different class of membership so there's many ways of doing this uh, Joanna, can I, sorry, can I just follow up, Nathan, with, with one other thing, because we've been talking a little bit about this uh, finance committee meeting that you attended, and I, I would be interested to know whether there's any other important information that came out during that meeting that you think would be um, helpful for the associations to, to know about. No, that meeting was the start. What we've, what we've been doing is trying to set up ongoing meetings and reporting and uh, processes to engage with shareholders and other stakeholders. So that's now started. We had a, our first shareholders meeting a, a week ago and the uh, meeting with the finance committee, committee is, is an interim meeting before the budget and it's just an information sharing. It's to just give them 
tell them what we've been doing and to sort of give them a heads up about budget. So that's that's all that happened in that. It was and and I could and there were a lot of questions around the law foundation and law foundation funding. So that's that was one thing that was this, that was that was raised. And the other was around equity of access uh, around every lawyer pays a library fee. Uh, they should all have access to a reasonable array of resources and it shouldn't be tethered just to the associations. So that is something that was raised by a couple of them. Um, and sorry, go ahead. Uh, so the, the, um, and then they they look forward to we'll be going back after to present a budget at some point. Do you, do you they, have they, do you have a scheduled appointment for that? No, not yet. Um, would you, would you agree to uh, let Fola know uh, in advance when when that when that is scheduled? Well, I will be meeting with Fola regularly to discuss various issues. So, yes, we'll and, we'll let all the shareholders know. And on on the Law Foundation issue, was there discussion about uh, learn uh, applying for a grant through the Law Foundation? The discussion with the Law Foundation was was a much broader discussion. It's around they have a statutory mandate to fund libraries. Why aren't they? that they noticed that they had provided funding to Library Co until 20, 2013 or 2014 and then it stopped. And so nobody quite knows why it stopped. And, but looking at the Law Foundation's uh, mandate and their policies and their, uh, that's on their website, I can see now that the libraries, the way they're structured because they're not fully open to the, the public, uh, don't quite fit in. And they also, the Law, the Law Foundation made a decision a lot, some time ago not to fund operations and ongoing operational costs. They fund projects with the exception of legal aid because 75% of their funding goes to legal, legal aid. So this is a bigger discussion around the role of the Law Foundation, their statutory mandate, what, it, what, what that means and can they just ignore it? So it's a, it's, it was a, at a very high policy level. So, so is, is this something that LEARN is gonna continue to sort oh, of absolutely. look at? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, so if That's there's important. a, you mentioned a computer upgrading uh, is, a, is a big need and that would be a capital expense probably more, more than an yep. operational one. So that might be something to apply to uh, uh, the foundation for, for example. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Uh, the other thing that I did say to the finance committee was that uh, there, there are some things, that not the, the computers and electronic resources that that will need some sort of one-time transitional, if you will, funding to get everybody up to the right, to an appropriate level. And we don't know what that looks like yet, but there'll be a combination of ongoing uh, operational in increases and uh, some, and, and ask for an infrastructure top up. We don't know what that Can looks I like yet, but still, we're still working on Can it. I if anybody else has any uh, final questions for Johan, I just see we're, we're sort of counting down in the last couple of minutes here. Uh, it's Steve Andary from Kent. I'm just wondering in your analysis, is there any recognition of the challenges for, well, law associations in primarily rural areas? Because our association is spread out over a county that is, I think by the last estimate, 95% of the land in this county is used for farming. And so we have areas of our uh, association, our members have spotty internet access at best. And when they are able to come into our library, that's when they have uh, far better access digitally to um, resources, never mind the actual hardcover books. Is there any acknowledgement of the challenges in your analysis? Uh, with the rural experience? Absolutely. That affects every province, every part of the country. Every library system that serves, that has a, that is a provincial base. The access to reliable uh, internet, reliable broadband, that is, is, a, is a key piece. And so you have to make sure, you have to make sure with this, that when you're, you're looking at areas that don't have such reliable access, that, you, that you've got the right mix of resources so that lawyers can access it and use them whether it's in print or whether it's having to go into the library. I, 
ideally, the provinces uh, and the, the government will start to improve uh, broadband and the internet access, but that's going to take some, some time. So yes, of course it comes in. It's a, it's, it's a key piece and it's not unique to Ontario. Thank you. So Johan, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. I know a lot of people um, have a lot of concerns about libraries. Uh, as you know, I, I'm foremost amongst them and I look forward to working with you in the coming weeks and months. Yeah. I know it's going to be a busy summer. I, I don't like working over the summer, but I think we've got lots to do and uh, I look forward to thank it. You. So thank you for your, uh, your hard work in this as well and Teresa's as well. Yeah, thank you very much for asking me. I'm always happy to come and speak. Thank you. Thank you. And Johan has been very great. If anybody has direct questions, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to me or her. Um, we are we are both very accessible. Thank you. And with that, uh, I would like to inter, uh, introduce Mike from the Case Lines program. Of course, anybody who is doing anything in Superior Court these days knows that Case Lines is the new online document uh, protocol that we are all going to be required uh, to use. Um, I thought it was only going to be civil, but uh, I've been informed uh, on my criminal cases as well. So I have to say I've come up uh, and uh, started using it, uh, taken some information from it and uh, am, am learning. So I'd like to introduce Mike from Case Lines. Hey everyone, uh, thank you very much for your uh, time today. And uh, I wanted to thank as well, the certainly the libraries over the years for supporting the use of our research tools. So, um, as Nathan mentioned, um, Thompson Reuters has been working with the Superior Court of Justice uh, for eight months now with the implementation of case lines. And it's moving into the Ontario courts in, uh, in July after the implementation at the Superior Court is finished. And so far it's really um, helped uh, the courts get uh, do over 7,000 cases online with over 10,000 users. So there's definitely a commitment there to continue case lines after the pandemic when we all get to that wonderful point when the pandemic's over with. And uh, it could, because it makes sharing of evidence very easy and streamlined in court and reduces travel to court um, at, gives the users the ability to add notes to documents and so on. So um, just today, I wanted to mention, we're very pleased to uh, be able to provide to FOLA members uh, a couple of introductory sessions on how case line works through the lens of a litigator. And we'll be sending out information on how to register right after the plenary session today. So uh, again, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, very nice to meet you. And hopefully this can be uh, in, in person at some point in the near future.